We're ready now for uh, the next speaker. Please, uh, we will have Ramia introduce the speaker. Uh, my name is Ramya, uh, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedicine, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Karin K. Madsen. She is the head of secretariat for the Danish Council of Research and Innovation Policy, and she's been there since 2007 has, and has been instrumental in shaping um, national research policies. It's also called the DFIR. Um, Karen finished her master's in political science at the University of Copenhagen. She also has a degree in international relations from the University of Sheffield. Um, so today she will talk to us about why it's difficult to attain a gender balance in the context of research. So please join me in welcoming Karen K. Madsen. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and I've really been looking forward to this. It's uh, so nice to see um, a lot of people being interested in this topic, or of course you are, but, uh, but still, it's, it's a, a topic which seems to be uh, neglected once in a while, so um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, as was said, I... Uh, <coughs> can you hear me? <coughs> Fine. Can you hear in the back, Council? <coughs> so... Yes. Måske skal du bare have den bagfra, sådan her. Hældet i nakken. Ja, sådan der. Og så er jeg Ja, Nemlig. Sådan. Prøv at lave en tester. Kan I høre mig nu? Er det bedre? Ja. Super. Så kan jeg også gå lidt frem og tilbage. Det begår mig meget bedre. Og så må I bære over med mit hår her. Så. <laughs> <laughs> øh, ja, altså jeg er sekretarischef for Danmarks Forskning og Innovationspolitiske Råd. Hvad siger I? English. Ah, sorry, yes, I switched. Sorry, thanks. So, I'm head of secretariat for the Danish Council for Research and Innovation Policy. And this council has basically been existing since uh, 1995 or something like that. No, uh, longer. Um, and the council provides research and innovation policy advice to the Danish Minister for Higher Education and the Danish Parliament. So the council doesn't have any money. Uh, it provides evidence-based policy advice. And the council are the nine uh, wonderful people, and one of them, the tall man in the middle you may know, he's uh, from this university, uh, Søren Keiding, and the others are also very, very nice people. <coughs> so they come from industry and they come from academia, uh, different universities, different uh, experiences, and the scope is that if these nine people can come to agree upon something, it might be worth listening to. So that's what we do in the Secretariat, we try to support them and to come up with policy advice in research and innovation policy that is, uh, that is interesting to listen to. The Council can provide policy advice on their own initiative and they can also be requested to do that uh, from a minister or from parliament and also from others. So what I would like to talk with you about today is basically two, well, one major uh, project we are doing right now which is called Career Path and I will show you a lot of numbers um, afterwards but first, I wanted just to show you very shortly that in 2015, uh, the previous Minister of Science and Higher Education, uh, Sophie Carsten Nielsen, asked the Council to see, could you actually say something about if you do initiatives to promote women in science, do they actually help? And could you look at internationally if, if this actually occurs? Because there was a major uh, discussion at that time uh, of a program called UDON, uh, so that some of you with Danish background might have heard about it, that a special program to promote women in science. Um, so she wanted to have some sort of evidence if this actually worked. And the council was working on this for about half a year and had a consultancy group to, uh, to do conduct interviews with policymakers and researchers and so on in four different countries. Um, and I'll come back to that um, in, a, in a short while. But just to say that uh, that was a specific project we were doing towards women in science. But firstly, 
the key findings from this project um, uh, to look at international uh, experiences with programs. This is from the, the <coughs> consultancy bureau, Oxford Research. They concluded that it actually works. When you do things, it works. And they also concluded <laughs> that if you put political pressure and a lot of interest to the issue of getting more women into science or research, there actually comes more women into science and research. And uh, it might seem a bit naive, but... Uh, <laughs> but it's actually quite important. And they could see that, uh, they, they looked at Finland, where there's been a lot of issues uh, to focus on more women in science for very many years. And uh, they could see previously, 15, 20 years ago, with a lot of political pressure to get more women into research, the number of women in research was really increasing. And eventually they thought, well, we're doing well, we don't need to have focus on that anymore. And then it stagnated, nothing else happened. When the political issue, it's not on the agenda anymore, it slows up. The other thing was in Austria and Switzerland, which the council assumed would be very backwards. <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> they were very progressive, they had a lot of initiatives going, and you could really see from a slow starting point, there was a major increase on all levels in research and science for women. And they could also see that the Netherlands, that have not had political focus on this issue, institutional but no political focus, um, nothing really happened. That's a very, very slow uh, development. So the council concluded, if you do things, it helps. Um, and uh, they were quite, quite happy about this. What happened then was that the, the council normally goes to the minister and delivers the report and say, now we, we have done this and we want to give you this piece of advice. And in the meantime, the minister had changed. And at that time, it was Esben Lunde Larsen. And he very clearly stated, thank you very much for the work. Um, it will not be read. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was uh, not that much came out of it, but I still think it's a quite interesting piece of work if you come around our website and, and want to see it. So what I basically wanted to talk with you about today was uh, the new project, Career Path. And as I said before, I will give you a lot of data. And most of the data <coughs> we've been taking from, when I say we, it's the Council of Research and Innovation Policy. And a lot of the data uh, we are relying on is already made public. You could find it everywhere. Uh, the data series are not compatible. Some of the data is a bit older because it's impossible to get um, new data. Uh, well, at least it has been very difficult for us. And some of, So you can't really compare all this data you're going to see now. So I just wanted to draw up the picture. And many of you already know this, the, the scissors diagram, which was developed in the, in the European Commission uh, years ago to show if you, if you actually count on all levels uh, the percentage of women in research, uh, you, could, you could see these scissors, they call it, uh, that in Europe, uh, more women start in university, more women complete their master program. When they start PhD, they're about even. And then there's a slow, um, small division for a long time, and then when you come to the real positions, so to speak, as associate professor and full professor, you will see the division starts and you will end up with a more or less uh, 20, um, 80 percent um, difference. So what you have here in August <coughs> University is exactly as what hap is happening in the rest of Europe. And what was very interesting, I was actually a member of the so-called Helsinki group before I started for in the council um, in, in the 90s. And the Helsinki group was a group, uh, ex expert group uh, providing advice to the European Commission on in women in science. And for the first time, we were actually gathering from different countries. Uh, and we all thought it was a specific national uh, problem. And we all had our own exp explanations of why this was the case. So from Denmark, we were always used to saying, it's not a problem. You could see the women are coming. You can see there are far more women on the master level and also on the PhD level. It's just a matter of time. They will be there. And in Germany, we're always saying it's because of the children. If we would only have kindergartens at the university, they will all be there. And so all different countries had their own explanations. Uh, and just to figure, to show these figures was actually quite an eye-opener uh, for many of us. Uh, but the picture all across Europe is more or less the same. If you look at the Danish um, 
the Danish picture, the sister diagram, you would see basically um, the problem is the same as in the rest of Europe. However, we have more women uh, in the master degree uh, than as a general level in Europe. Uh, we see the break uh, comes uh, also at the PhD level, and we see that there's a, there's a division, but it's not that big until the, it's very, very uh, clear in the Danish case. The glass ceiling sets in uh, when you move from assistant professor to associate professor, the level of women falls. Now, there's no progress in this. This is just to count how it was in 2013. And I took this number because the European number was from 2013 as well. So, And it's, it's probably a bit better, but not very much. Uh, so this is the, the international scene. So the percentage of female professor is what we focus very much on when we talk about women in science. It's like the standard key performance indicator, if you could say that. And uh, whenever the, the she figures from the European Commission comes, we look at the she figures to see, well, how are we doing? How are we doing? And we see Denmark. Well, I know we are a bit below the EU average. We are uh, above the UK, and we are above Germany, and slightly below France. And we could see we progressed from 2010 to 13 uh, very little. Um, so the focus is very much on the level of professors. And um, we don't talk that much about the other levels. And the council has been just looking at if the professor level is actually the best indicator for progress. And these are only Danish figures. And these are based, uh, these data is from the Ministry of Higher Education and Science. And uh, it's all what the universities are reporting themselves. So it's basically the university's own figures. And you can see the last figure here is 2017, and we can see that we are very happy. The professor level is from 2010 till 17, uh, increased from 16% till 22%. But if we look at the other levels, the associate and the assistant professor level, the same picture doesn't imply there. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? That um, somehow, with a lot of focus on the professor level, we managed to increase the level of professors, but we don't look at the associate professors and the assistant professors, and nothing happens. <clears throat> now, just uh, methodology-wise, the academic levels here imply a assistant level. In these groupings I'm talking about is both uh, assistant professor, which is in Danish, uh, and postdocs. And it's a bit... Um, Odd that they are collected in the same uh, grouping here because they, they behave very differently. <laughs> but when I say assistant level, it's both postdocs and uh, uh, assistant professors. Associate level is basically associate professors, lecture, but it's also senior, senior researchers. And professor level, it's full professors, the ordinary professors, which is, they're called in Danish, and it's professor MSO, and I don't know what it's being translated into. So I will call it MSO here, and I don't know if you know what it is. Special. But it's a, it's a special professor um, uh, category we have in Denmark. It could be five years professor, so it's not a permanent position. Um, it's a, it's a, a short-term position, and it's supposed to mean MSO in Danish means med særlige opgaver, which is with special um, tasks. Uh, and then we have the clinical professors, which are mainly in the, the, the health area. But these three levels are um, what I hear would refer to as the professor level. <clears throat> and the reason I say it's interesting to look at the professors is that when you look at the full professors and the uh, professor MSO, we, we found out that the ordinary professors, like the, the, the normal professors, the number is not 22%, but it's 19.6%. And the professor MSO, like the, the short-term professorships for women, is 32%. So it's the stock there, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, the clinical professors are also more, but it's only related to, to one area, so I'm not going to go into too more with this. <clears throat> so we've actually been wondering about, is it because women are only hired as MSO professors? Is that sort of a, a lady professorship? Or is it because, um, or is it because the professors are very old, 
And it's, uh, the MSO category is relatively no new, so when you hire people, it takes a long time until it evens out. Um, and I was really hoping to get the uh, recruitment figures, and I got them last night at 5 o'clock, so I'm going to show them to you later. <laughs> and we've really been, <laughs> been interested to see if we could see any uh, difference there, and we were hoping there wouldn't be any difference, because then life would be better, wouldn't it? But, um, yeah. So, the percentage of women in faculty positions now... You were talking about Aarhus University and Aarhus being very bad, but I can assure you that Aarhus is exactly on the same level as average Denmark. No worse, no, and it's basically Aarhus is the average. <laughs> so um, some are doing better, some are doing worse, but uh, but it's it's a it's a general problem. <clears throat> now, why is this happening? Why don't we just hire more women and then it would all be good? And this next part of my speech, I will try to concentrate why this apparently is slightly different. And now I will just show you a couple of slides which are not related to specifically women in science, but just general in science at universities. And before I start, you might want to tell me, this is not relevant for my faculty, this is not relevant for my university, we do it differently, but I can assure you that we've been through universities We've been through the different scientific areas. This occurs everywhere. So what the interesting part here is that if you look at the, the light blue, the 26%, these are positions, and it's all three levels I was mentioning before, associate, assistant, and full professors. These are the positions in 2015 to 2017 which were recruited to, and there were no open calls. So about... A quarter of all the positions, there are no open calls. So if you want to hire and have competition, of course, it would be nice with open calls, then you could follow it. If you look at the other part, the, the gray part, you would see uh, apparent, um, approximately the same size. Um, there's only one qualified candidate for the position. So of all the recruitment at the Danish universities, it's only a little less than half of the positions that you actually have competition. Yes? This position, is that all positions? So it's temporary positions or is it all positions? Well, it's, it, it, it is all positions, yes. It, it's associate, prof assistant and full pro and professor level. So it's all the positions of all the universities that have been... Uh, assistant professors? Yes. Because I think a lot of them could Temporary. Well, they are temporary, but yes, uh, yes, yes. A lot of them are temporary. It's it's all positions, <coughs> but still, yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, it, it's true. So it's all positions that have been uh, reported. Um, then we try to see how much diversity <laughs> are there actually at the universities. Uh, we have had a lot of more money coming to the universities, there are much more persistence at the universities than previously. How does it actually look with diversity? And again, this is not related to women in science. So we went back in the recruitment statistics back to 95 to see how has this evolved. And what we actually thought was interesting in this, how regardless how much money and how many persistence come into the system, basically around 70%, which is the, the red line there, um, basically around 70% of all, um, all recruitment comes from the same university. Um, so we would have expected to see a lot more mobility uh, between the Danish universities and, and also international, but ap approximately 70% uh, always comes from the, the same university. So we tried to see, if you look at the po population of women in research, uh, which I, I named before the percentages. If we look at that and then we see how many more were recruited. Uh, are they recruited more women than the stock or less women than the stock? We can see that most universities, also University of Aarhus, recruit more women than they have in the stock already. Um, so we can basically just see that it's two universities that tend to recruit less women than they, they have already. And then we, we were wondering about all these positions without open calls. Uh, 
So we tried to have a special um, look at the, the, the open calls versus the, the calls with no open calls. And we can see, well, you can see the figures here, and they're not so, so big, and it's from 2011 to 2013. And this was already published uh, in the report from um, a previous minister had a task force for war, more women in science uh, some years ago uh, that stated a lot of very good statistics about this issue. And these figures are from this, this task force, and therefore the, the, the figures are a bit older. But in general, we could see it helps with open calls. When there are open calls, women tend to get the position to a higher degree than without own calls. Um, and now you might say it's very odd because the, the law states that all positions must be in open calls. And there's a possibility of calling uh, professors or associate professors and so on. But with the level of external funding, a lot of positions are on name, which is just called in Danish. So if you get a very nice um, funding from the Danish <coughs> National Research Foundation, it might be on a specific name, and then they can hire specific people within this. And of course, this are not open calls from the university, and therefore more open external funding tends to be less open calls. <coughs> Sorry, I, I just want to make sure that I am understanding correctly the numbers. So it says there that without open call, only 17% of women are actually called to female professors. I mean, no, 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 no. This, this is, no. This is when you recruit. Either you have an open call. Yeah, uh, yeah. But out of 100 persons that are recruited in Denmark, only 17 are women. That would be? No. Okay. No. So, uh, so these are the, without open calls, these are all the positions. Okay. So if you have 100 positions where it's not called, so yeah. you're just... Uh, hired without uh, uh, an advertisement. Okay, so in it's this, only numbers within women. Okay, so, so, so if you have 100 professorships that are just hired without an open call, yeah. only 17% of these go to women. No, well, that's, I mean, that's okay. crazy. So, and if you have an open, <laughs> and if you have an open call, at least 24% <laughs> yeah, yeah. of the professors will be women. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's still not very good, but it's slightly better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, in that respect, the council is just concluding that open calls sort of support women more than, than yes. That totally happens at the professor level. Yeah. Yeah. Two other levels basically have felt yeah. different or yeah. in the other direction. So yeah. how do you understand that? No, I cannot give reasons for why the figures look like that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. But I think, I mean, making the conclusion Opel calls for women. At senior level. Those days, at senior level, yes. At, yeah, at the highest level. But yes. Only at the highest yeah. level. And that might be if you have a, uh, s so we have more external funding now than we used to have, also from private foundations and so on. And what we also have found out is that a lot of the external funding has sort of, the instruments regarding external funding has changed. So what we see is that the external funding is to a large extent being concentrated in very big lumps. So you need to have a very good professor to apply for a very large sum of money, and then they hire PhDs and postdocs. Uh, whereas 20 years ago, more the external funding was less. Uh, but the external funding, there was also more money for assistant and associate professors that they could apply for in their own name. Uh, so what you see is that this money goes to a professor, and then they hire. So the non-open calls on uh, assistant professor level would probably be as a part of a large research um, uh, group. Yeah. <clears throat> so, as I said before, we wanted to see if the, the professor MSO, that women, it's a ladies' professorship, or if it's not. Um, and then we could see, and this is, these are figures from 11 to 17, um, and we can see that there are, there's a slight difference. There's a tendency that women, to a larger extent, when they get professors, get to be Professor MSO uh, than men, but the figures are not that devastating as, as when you look at the whole population. 
So it's, it's, and we're very happy it's not as bad as we feared. Now, I talked before about these open calls and not open calls. Now we only look at those calls that have been publicly announced, so the open calls. And when we look at all them, we could see that quite a few of these positions do either not have men or women that are qualified for these positions. And now we're coming into the real problem of why we don't just hire a lot of women. Because we, as you see, on the professor level and the associate professor level and assistant professor level, there are high numbers of positions where there are no qualified applicants. And of course, then it makes it difficult. Yes, you want to say something? Yeah, but because my question, I think these are very useful numbers, but it would be interesting to see how many applications came as a first line. So what number of male and female came, and um, what percentage of them were considered um, qualified? Because if we want to talk about a, a gender bias that is hidden, maybe in the process of qualification there is already a gender bias in, in that sense. So if I'm presented with 10 women and 10 men, maybe seven are qualified of the men and only four are qualified of the women. And that starts to be a little bit strange. Um, yeah. So, so the, the entrance level is also important. How many applications they receive? Yeah. I didn't bring the figures. Uh, I can find out later. Yeah, uh, but yeah, no, I, because I think that's yeah. an important issue as well. That will be a yeah. hidden, hidden uh, gender mm. bias. That could, be, that could be a hidden gender bias. Yes, I think we concentrated on the qualified applicants because we didn't want to get into sort of discussion whether women, women or men were more or less qualified. But just to say, well, this is what happens when you actually have the ones being qualified. But it is possible to make this calculation uh, because it's also... In, this, in these statistics, you ask both for how many applicants were there and how many were qualified and who actually got the position. So it is possible, and I, kept, uh, I can advise that the Ministry of Higher Education and Science, actually, and the statistics in their website, they, uh, they publish every three years, they publish a very, very nice uh, uh, note on uh, statistics about recruitment. Um, and um, I don't know if they have all, the, they don't have all the same figures as we do. Uh, but it's, uh, they follow it, and you can see a lot of information about uh, men and women when it comes to recruitment. So, these were the, these were the, the positions where there were no qualified men or women. As I, yes, now I, yeah. And f when we lower and see only look at the positions where there were both men and women qualified. So now we narrow the competition. These are very few uh, positions we're actually talking about because a lot of the positions, there's only one qualified. So now we narrow uh, the, pos the, the, the positions where there were both men and women that were actually competing about the positions. And when we look at them, we can see that women are actually good at getting the positions but it's just very, very few positions you have an actual competition between men and women. Now, this is something uh, <laughs> completely different. These were figures about the recruitment statistics um, because I wanted to, to show you that it's difficult uh, just to hire women. Um, and we had a, um, a, a, a conference um, one and a half months ago where Jens Jort who is a center leader at the Danish um, at the University of Copenhagen? He was saying, "Well, if you want more women, you should hire more women," and that's what he's doing at his center. But you really have to make an effort because numbers it, it doesn't just come as itself. It's it's actually difficult because there are very few positions. All right, what we are doing now is not to look at the recruitment. We wanted to see, and this is part of the council's project of career path. We wanted to see, uh, in general, does it take longer time to get to be a professor today than many years ago? Because the assumption was that it's very difficult to be a postdoc in Denmark now because there are so many of them. So 
uh, we had a Damba uh, Analytics, which is a consultant agency, and we had the permissions from the Minister of Finance to use all um, salary data for all researchers in Denmark on an aggregated level. And in there, you can follow how much they, they get in salary, but also uh, when you switch from one um, category to the next category. Uh, so you can actually follow how long time people stay in a position and how when they, they transfer to the next position. And that is really, really interesting and also very sad. Because we can see as a general level, and that's nothing to do with this, today in Denmark it takes two years more to become a professor than it did 15 years ago. Things are slowing up in the career path in Denmark. And then we thought, well, it would be nice to see if there's a gender difference and if it actually matters if you have children or not. So we ran these figures also on, uh, on, on gender and on uh, whether people have children or not. And we cannot see if it's one or more children. It's just a matter of if you have children. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we divide it up. So everyone who's got a PhD degree from a Danish university, and we have three cohorts uh, from 1999 till 2002, and from 2002 to 2006, and seven to nine. So these three groups, we were following to see, well, six years after, where are they? And this only replies to people who are within university. This slide has nothing to do with people leaving and going into industry and so on. Everyone here is, <laughs> is at the university still. And we thought, well, how long time should it take from you finish your PhD degree until you're actually through sort of the training positions and you can have an associate professorship? Six years. So how many people manage to get to be an associate professor within six years from they get their PhD degree? And then we looked at these cohorts and we could see that there used to be a major difference. And first of all, I would like you to draw your attention to, to some of the early cohorts between women, men and women, and especially actually those without children, which are the lower three parts. I know this is in Danish, and I'm sorry because I had to copy paste it. I don't have access to the real data myself, so that's why it's in Danish. And please let me know if I'm going too fast and you don't understand. But I would like to draw your attention to the lower three uh, groupings, and the dark blue one is women, and the light blue one is males. And I've never actually seen that before, because there used to be quite a, a difference between men and women, also those who do not have children. Uh, which is interesting because we tend to talk very much about maternity leave as being the, the main problem. So we could see, at least it used to be, that there was a major difference between men and women, also those who, who did not have children. We could also see that it, children used to be uh, the major issue of whether you became uh, an associate professor fast. The ones without children used to go really fast through the system uh, and progress in a career. For the last uh, cohort, we can see that basically everybody slows up, also the ones without children. And we can see that today, women, without, women with children are really having a difficult time to come through the early stages. And I'm sorry if I'm, it, it might be very depressing to hear, but it's, um, it's also very interesting. And one interesting part is there's only one group that is doing slightly better. Just a second. One group that's doing slightly better in the news cohort, and that's actually males with children. So where women with <laughs> so it's it's quite interesting. So, but uh, we we cannot see in the figures uh, what's happening. It's just you could just see this. Uh, so we thought it would be interesting to share. Yes. I wanted to ask if the six years if they include uh, paternity or maternity leave. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's yes, so, yes. And of course, it would have been nice if we have cleaned it from maternity leave, but that's methodologically a bit difficult in the in the following the payment, uh, the salary statistics. So we cannot uh, cope for for maternity leave. Yes. So uh, from this depressing thing, what is actually happening then to the ones who leaves academia? Uh, and we tried to, to do that as well. It's the same colors. Women is the dark blue, men is the light blue, the same three cohorts. 
uh, the same uh, years. And here we saw how many actually left academia, how many left universities six years after they finished their PhD. And here we could also see that um, that <laughs> basically a lot of people are leaving the universities, but we can also see that women, uh, the, the greatest uh, increase has, has, has come from the women. So if you actually look at, at the, the, the recruitment base for women in science and to promote onto the, to the full professor level, uh, it, it matters the proportion of, of how people are leaving academia. So, these were the figures I wanted to show you, and what is the council then sort of concluding? Well, they are saying that um, transparency and open calls basically helps. It's good, the more transparency you can have. Uh, they, they think it's a pity that there are so many, or so few positions where there are open calls and where men and women are actually competing. It would be a more healthy uh, academic system uh, with the co real competition between the sexes. Uh, they also note that when it occurs, women have good chances of actually getting the positions. And then they are worried it takes longer time to become an associate professor. It's not necessarily very good for the quality of academia that it, it becomes more and more troublesome to be there. Uh, sex seems to have less impact today than earlier. Everybody is slowing down, and especially women with children are slowing down. Uh, and women with children are increasingly leaving academia. So, and the last, very not very optimistic uh, note I would like to share with you is we also looked at the salary, how much on a lifespan people are earning uh, in academia. And we can see that it's really, really expensive to get children. It basically costs you a thousand kroner per month for a life. So, um, with these depressing uh, okay. comments, <laughs> I'll say thank you very much. But, uh, he invited me. Thank you very much, Karen. We have about five minutes for extra questions. And now we have a new minister. Uh, is it a time for you? Uh, it's a window of opportunity to ask him to read the report. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, we have an old report here. Um, well, I can I can see. Uh, well, it's true. Uh, it it it, uh, it matters very much what sort of minister there is, if there's a focus on this or not. Um, we just two weeks ago the negotiations of the fin the, the the finance bill was negotiated, and Sophie Kasten Nielsen, uh, who is now a member of Parliament, was actually um, making part of the agreement that there should be a, a yearly view of women in science and there should be a roundtable discussions uh, with politicians and management and that has been accepted and, and there's a focus on that. But of course, as we have a, a discussion in Denmark, there comes a new minister and there's been a new minister every uh, once a year uh, for the last four years. Uh, and if they have not been occupied with this before, you start from the scratch and say, why is this a problem? Um, so it takes some time, but I think he's, uh, he's really, really interested. Um, and of, of course, there's also a political uh, culture in Denmark that as soon as you talk about women in science, people tend to get very frightened that you start talking about uh, quotas and so on. So, <laughs> so we try to stay away from that. You can talk about plenty of things without ending up in quotas. So. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for the very sad talk, I guess. <laughs> yes. but at the very beginning, you said that uh, it helps actually, so based on numbers from other countries, to implement other instruments to promote women. So aside from more open calls, what would you recommend? Um, well, we could see that in Denmark, there have, there's been uh, twice we've had like national programs where money was set aside not solely for women, but um, uh, in the 19th there was a fire program, a minister that really wanted to, to, to promote this, and uh, about, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, the Udon program also in this. And uh, of course, there's been a very harsh discussion in Denmark about these programs and whether it was helpful or harming more, but it comes to a state where it's being discussed, and as soon as people are basically discussing these issues, uh, this whole gender bias 
uh, it helps in the respect for gender bias that you just discuss it because you become more aware. The research councils start doing their figures on, on, on sex and they realize what's happening. And uh, so I, I, I would, in Denmark, I would not suggest to do uh, quotas and these basically programs because it's, it, it might harm more than, than good is. But I personally find it difficult to understand why um, I talked with the, uh, the, the head of the Irish Science Foundation and to be a peer reviewer for the Irish Science Foundation, you need to take an online course in gender bias. Um, and I haven't done it, but it's it's not some, uh, gender bias is not something that is only something men has. I mean, women fail just <laughs> in high numbers, and um, so it's you could do a lot of other things that that would probably help and support, and just to have focus and talk about it. I think it up there. Yes, and then I trust that because it's clear that the open calls are a bit better, give better chances to women. But that for me, that I say, the funding seems to go more to men. So, would it be possible to study if there is a gender bias in funding agencies in Denmark? Because I think there is. Well, and because there have been a lot of focus on this, the funding, the state funding agency are actually every second year publishing uh, all their figures and gender, so you can see how many applied and for how much money was applied and who actually got the funding. Uh, and I didn't bring the figures here and I can't remember them. Uh, so there's a gender bias when it comes to how much money uh, and how much uh, uh, funding women and men are getting. But when you look at how much money women and men were applying for, it's basically so much less. I mean, it, it, it equals up. So it's not that women are applying for a lot of money and then they don't get it. Um, but um, there's a, a major difference between how much funding uh, people, uh, women and men were applying for. Yes, there was another, yes. Um, it's uh, in regard to the question before uh, about national legislation and requirements. So you mentioned that Austria and Switzerland uh, were doing quite well regarding the, to avoid gender bias and I was wondering what their implementations were. Yeah. Um, I can't remember all their programs, but they actually have had <laughs> quite a few programs like the Udon program uh, to, to promote women, also on different levels, and they also, I think it was Austria that had a program promoting basically women in industry, in, in, in science and industry. Uh, so they had also a lot of debate about it and focus and uh, statistics and so on. Uh, Oxford Research, who was actually doing this report, uh, put in the back of the report uh, all the links to all the different uh, instruments. Um, and perhaps I can just send you the, the link and then you could perhaps distribute the report <coughs> because it's much easier to, to look there. Oh, there was, uh, I'm afraid that uh, we're running out of time and there so will be no, time, well, no more time for questions. But please approach Karen well, while we have uh, coffee. Uh, thank you. Um, and sorry, we have to keep a uh, schedule. Thank <laughs> you.